Today marks the third week of Advent, and um, we heard that Advent scripture being read this morning, and we anticipate Christmas. Did you kids know Christmas is in three weeks? You guys excited about that? Who here is excited about Christmas? Yeah. Oh, 10 days. Did I say three weeks? <laughs> oh, man. Pastor Clint is losing it. Three weeks, 10 days, that's even better, isn't it? Okay, all right. Well, it's the third week of Advent, not three weeks before Christmas. All right. So, uh, being the third week of Advent, all over the world today, there's uh, Christians across the planet celebrating the joy of the Lord. And... Um, wasn't your hearts filled with joy when we saw these little kids doing their Christmas play? Yeah, it was awesome, wasn't it? So we're here today listening to this play, singing these songs to celebrate and commemorate our Savior's arrival in Bethlehem just over 2,000 years ago. On the eve of, Christ, of Jesus' birth, we read in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Messiah, the Lord. So here we sing, see in this scene that was written about in Scripture that the angels of heaven appeared to a group of shepherds on the dark hills surrounding the little town of Bethlehem. And Bethlehem is just a tiny little town, kids. Even to this day, it's not a very large place. But this is one of the most important announcements of all time. There was some very good news that was being announced. You see, the world up to that point had been groaning under the weight of sin without true relief. And the only relief offered was the temporary relief of sin that was bought, brought through the Jewish temple system where people would come to pray and offer sacrifices to God as an appeasement, as a temporary covering for their sins. But the creator of the universe saw everything as it was, and at just the right time, he decided that he was going to step in to the world and run an intervention to save people from their sins. You see, the creator of the universe had called the Jewish nation the nation of Israel, to be his representatives to the people of the earth, to take his message to the world. But it, the people of Israel, just like everyone else in the world, were entangled by a grip of sin. And even though they wanted to do the right things, they found themselves often doing the wrong things, and their hearts were shifted, and then they began to want to do the wrong things instead of the right things. They were unable to break free from the shackles that bound the human heart. Did you kids know this? That we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And there's shackles of chains wrapped around people's hearts. But God saw, he saw a way out of this. He planned for it actually. See, God throughout the history of Israel sent prophets to the people who predicted that one day a Savior, who they call the Blessed Messiah, would be sent into the world to save people from the power of the chains of sin. In the book of Genesis, right at the first book of the Bible, chapter 49, verse 10, there was a prophecy given to one of the founding fathers of the nation of Israel. Jacob spoke to his son Judah about the coming 
of a Savior, a Messiah in the future days. Jacob was given insight by God that one of his future offspring would come into the world to be the king of all kings, to be the Lord of all lords. Jacob said to Judah prophetically, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be his. The Bible tells us that this coming king would not be born in a palace surrounded by gold and silver and great uh, beautiful furnishings. No. This king would be born in humble circumstances in a stable, in a little obscure village. And the birth of the Savior was heralded by the angels of heaven to lowly shepherds and later to wise men and kings. See, the good news being given to the world was to be for all people. Not just big people, but little people. Not just rich people, but poor people. Because everybody, regardless whether they're rich or poor, whether you're young or old, needed freedom from the shackles and bondage of sin. And God in his mercy decided that he would come down he would come down to make a way for those chains and shackles to be taken away from the people. And that is good news. That's the good news of Christmas. This is why the coming of the Lord was such joyful news. The little baby Jesus born in Bethlehem the first Christmas morning would be God's word in bodily form shown to us. The Savior, the Savior would be God's word of compassion to people that needed compassion. He would be God's word of hope to a world at that time without much hope. He would be God's word of peace to a world that was filled with conflict. He would be God's word of joy to a world that was filled with sorrow. And he would be a word of God's love to the people of the world. The Savior would be a word of compassion. Isn't it nice to know that our God is compassionate towards us? He, bring, he would bring a word of justice where there's injustice everywhere, the Lord, the Word, the living Word would bring justice. A word of forgiveness, a, world, a word of reconciliation to a lost humanity that had been broken and separated from their Creator by the power of sin. And kids, this is the good part. This was cause for great joy for all the people and that is what the angel that night that you guys were acting this play on, that's what he was heralding to the shepherds that night. That Jesus would be born that first Christmas to be the living word of God spoken to us concerning the very character, nature, and purposes of God. In John chapter 1, verse 14, we read, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. And that living word came to give his life to us as a gift of life in product, prophetic foresight for the coming salvation through Jesus. Isaiah said this in Isaiah 61, 10 and 11, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in the Lord, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation 
and has arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adores, he adorns his head like a priest, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for the soil makes the sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow. The sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. You see, kids, now this is the message of Christmas. Because all of humanity was spiritually dead in their sins, the world urgently needed a Savior. And God determined to save us by the strength of his own arm. The scripture tells us that authentic joy and true happiness is found in God's presence. Did you know that? I love the joy that overflows from the very essence of God's character. In 1 Chronicles 16, 27, the Bible says this, that splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. And God made us a way to access his presence through Jesus. The baby Jesus, you see, didn't just stay a baby. The baby Jesus would grow and become, become the world's greatest teacher. Jesus entered his ministry miraculously, miraculously healing the sick. You guys have seen the Bible stories. You've heard the Bible stories. They're all true. That's the good news. He healed the sick. He opened blind eyes. He fed hungry people with very little. He multiplied bread and fed them. He gave hope to the helpless rescued those who were weary and even raised the dead. The truth is that sometimes people want to try and figure out their lives for themselves and, and they want to try and find joy in living through their own earthly pursuits, but the things of this world can never bring any of us lasting joy. There's nothing you can do. Kids, none of your toys, none of the activities that you pursue, none of your video games, none of that is going to bring you lasting joy because authentic joy that God brings is not found in the things of this world. Life is so much more than just making a living and going through our school, going through life and trying to make it through the day. See, the good news that the angels heralded to the shepherds that first Christmas was that he has made a way for us to come to know him. Our creator, God, has made a way to come to know him through Jesus. It's not all in here. It's in here. Just like that song we sang, we give him our heart. See, God wants your heart to be given over to him. And if you give God your heart, he fills you with his spirit and his spirit brings joy that this world can't give you and this world can't take it away from you. Someone said here this morning in Advent, I think Rod Schneider, Mr. Schneider said this, that it's not dependent on anything that happens around us. You can have a very bad day. Things can go very wrong, but you can still have the joy of the Lord as your strength. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. You see, the story of the manger in Bethlehem and the story of the cross are inseparable stories. The two stories are together. And Jesus came into this world so that we could have abundant life, not just little smidgens of life, but life to its very fullest. And the Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5.15 concerning what Jesus came to do. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view though we once regarded Christ in this, in this way. 
We do so no longer. Therefore, now listen to this. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All of this is from God who reconciled himself, reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God was making his appeal through us. We implore you on God's behalf, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And Jeremiah has some good advice for all of us to follow. And kids, listen to this. Jeremiah the prophet said, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. Now it might seem strange to find joy by trusting someone else. But that someone else that you put your trust in is not just an ordinary person. The person you place your trust in is the living God who created all the universe. And he created you and he knows you by name. He knows everything about you and he wants you to walk with him and he invites you to do that. So today, we're preparing for a holiday, right? Holiday, Christmas. Do you know what holiday is? Holy day, holy day, holiday, holy day. The holy day where we remember that God came to us and God gave us everything so that we could know him and have everlasting life. So my prayer for you today is the same prayer that the Apostle Paul had for the early church in Rome, and he said this. This was his prayer, and this is my prayer for you today. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. That's my prayer. God bless you. Merry Christmas. We have joy in our hearts. We have a great banquet to go down to today and have a, a lunch together. So let's sing, let's sing joy to the world as we close this morning service. Before we do, I'm just going to quickly pray. Would you stand with me? We're going to pray. Jesus, we thank you for the joy that is in you. We thank you, Lord, that you have overcome the enemy and that you have given us hope. You've given us peace. You've given us joy. You've given us a future because of your love for us. God, I pray that your grace and peace would rest on your people today as they go. May we have sweet fellowship with one another. May those hearts that are discouraged this morning be filled with encouragement to know that you are with them. And God, may we be able to encourage others as we uh, visit after the service today. And Lord Jesus, most of all, we just give you our heart. We surrender everything that we are to you, Lord. And we ask God that you would fill us with your joy unspeakable and full of glory. In Jesus' name, amen.